Conorak Synthesumphone was born on December 1, 1976 in Laos, Asia. He was one of eight children of Somdian Sounthone Synthesumphone. Conorak had three sisters and four brothers. According to New York Times Sounthone, Conorak's father was a rice farmer in Laos. Communist forces overthrew the country's monarchy in the 1970s. At some point, the government tried to seize his land and accused Sounthone of wrongdoing. The family denied their accusations. He decided to take his family and leave Laos for their own safety. Conorak was too young to remember the post-war years, but they had a profound impact on his family. In late night of March 1979, when Conorak was three years old, Sounthone put his family on a canoe and sent them across the Mekong River to Thailand. He and his wife Somdi drugged their younger children with sleeping pills in case they cried and alert the soldiers guarding the river. Several days later Sounthone swam across the river and joined his family. They lived in the Nong Kai refugee camp for a year. Conorak's older brother Anouk told the New York Times that their life wasn't easy back then, so the family decided to move to the United States. In 1980, an American-based refugee relocation program helped them move to Wisconsin. At that time, Milwaukee had a Laotian community of about 7,000 people. They believed that moving there would give them better quality of life than living in Laos. The family settled in Milwaukee. Eight children and their parents were living under one roof in the city's Laotian community. At first it wasn't easy, but while the years passed by most of the family members learned English and assimilated into American culture. Conorak was a freshman at Pulaski High School, dreamed of becoming an engineer, and was bilingual in Laotian and English. He liked Lamborghinis, drawing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and playing soccer at Mitchell Park. He also enjoyed swimming and watching Tom and Jerry cartoons. His family called him Kolak. The Synthesumphone family struggled with financial challenges, so Conorak and his siblings tried to help them by earning their own money. His older siblings moved out on their own and got jobs as welders, mechanics, and assembly line workers. Conorak's older brother Somsak met Dahmer in 1988 at 13 years old. Dahmer lured him to his apartment, offered him money as an exchange of posing for nude photos. Somsak's family needed money, so he agreed. Dahmer drugged and sexually abused the boy. Luckily, Somsak managed to escape and the incident was reported to the police. On September 27, 1988, Dahmer was arrested for second-degree sexual assault and enticing a minor. Dahmer was sentenced to eight years in prison, but after writing a judge a letter of regret, he was granted early release one year into his prison sentence, but spent only a week in jail before he was released on bail. Three years after Somsak's assault, the killer lured Conorak to his apartment, also promising him money in exchange for nude photos. Once Conorak was in his apartment, Dahmer drugged the 14-year-old and tortured him by injected diluted hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe of his brain. Around 2 a.m. the killer stepped out of his apartment to go buy alcohol and Conorak managed to escape from his apartment. He was found naked, dazed, and barely communicating in the street by the building where Dahmer lived, by teenager Nicole Childress, who called the police. Nicole was around with her boyfriend, cousin Sandra Smith and friend Tina Spivey. Officer John Balserzak and his partner Joseph Gabrish arrived at the scene. When the police tried to question Conorak, Dahmer returned home. He stated that Conorak was his drunk 19-year-old boyfriend. Nicole Childress didn't believe him and pressed the police not to leave Conorak with the man, but the officers threatened her and her friends with arrest. Nicole decided to run to the apartment of her aunt, Sandra Smith's mother, hoping that the police would be more willing to talk to an adult. When she returned to the scene, no one was there. Conorak, Dahmer, or the police. Nicole didn't know at the time whether the injured boy had been taken to the hospital or taken into Dahmer's care. The girl then asked her aunt Glenda Cleveland to call the police and find out how the boy was feeling. The woman called, but did not obtain any relevant information. When a photo of the missing boy, who was Conorak, appeared in the newspaper, she also called, but she was not taken seriously. On May 27, 1991, police officers John Balserzak, Joseph Gabrish and Richard Perubkin escorted the wounded and naked boy to Dahmer's apartment. Dahmer showed the police the photos he took of Conorak. He convinced them they were consensual gay lovers. He used their homophobia to get rid of them. 
They didn't bother to look at Dahmer's file, because he didn't give a bad impression. However, if they looked into them, they would find out that he was on probation for child assault. And if they had searched the apartment, they would have found the body of Dahmer's 12th victim, Tony Hughes, in one of the rooms. John Balserzak, Joseph Gabrish, and a rookie officer Richard Perubkin escorted Conorak back to Dahmer's apartment. In the recordings of the incident, one of the officers can be heard joking that after leaving Dahmer's apartment, he must delouse and that they did not want to listen to Glenda Cleveland, Sandra Smith's mother, who called the police but couldn't get anybody to take her seriously or go to Dahmer's apartment and check on the boy. She kept trying. She called back after she saw Conorak's photo in a newspaper article reporting his disappearance. No one would listen. She even called the FBI, but they decided they did not have jurisdiction. Thirty minutes after officers left, Dahmer injected a second dose of hydrochloric acid into Conorak's brain, what caused his death. After the horrific trauma the Synthesumphone family endured at the hands of Jeffrey Dahmer, the family sued the city of Milwaukee, Balserzak and Gabrish. They said the police discriminated against Conorak either because he was Asian or because they thought he was gay. gay. A judge dismissed the family's claim that the police violated Conorak's civil rights, maintaining the officers could not be expected to recognize the danger Dahmer posed. The allegations made by the family did not only refer to negligence resulting in the failure to protect Conorak from Dahmer. As the details of the crime came to light, Milwaukee Police Chief, Philip Ariola, fired John Balserzak and Joseph Gabrish for failing to do their job properly. Ariola said officers failed to check Conorak's ID, did not thoroughly question witnesses, or even called their superiors for advice. The Synthesomphones settled with the Milwaukee Common Council and received $850,000, the 2022 document Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. It can be inferred that Conorak knew that Dahmer was molesting his brother. In fact, this is not true. Conorak's family knew nothing about Somsak's torturer. They didn't know his name or what he looked like. Dahmer also didn't know that Conorak and Somsak were brothers. Although Joseph Gabrish and John Balserzak protested the decision, the Milwaukee Fire and Police Commission upheld the exemption in 1992. However, in 1994, a judge finally ordered Joseph and John reinstated with back pay of approximately $55,000 each. After being reinstated, Joseph and John continued their long careers in law enforcement. John Balserzak remained in Milwaukee and was elected president of the Milwaukee Police Association in 2005. John served in that position until 2009 before stepping down and embarking on a career as a high-ranking police officer. However, reports say that John retired in 2017 and still appears to live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. On the other hand, Joseph joined the Grafton Police Department in 1993 and by 2016 he had been promoted to captain. Moreover, according to sources, Joseph was the chief of police in Trenton, Wisconsin, and is still enjoying a career in law enforcement. The Synthesumphone family struggled greatly with their son's death. Many of them described feeling numb. Soundthone regretted coming to America in the first place. I escaped the communists and now this happens. Why? After learning about the fate of Conorak, his father Soundthone, unemployed, was listlessly in the kitchen smoking cigarettes, unable to speak about his son's death. His mother, Somdi, has fainted three or four times since the news arrived, family members said, and one day on early morning she was rushed to a local hospital by one of her sons because she was shaking uncontrollably. His four brothers and three sisters have existed in a numb world in which they quietly reflect about their brother. We don't have energy to do anything, said Anouk Synthesumphone, a 27-year-old brother of Conorak. We can't sleep. We can't eat. The family has turned to their culture and faith for comfort. They have built a small shrine, with a photo of Conorak surrounded by burning candles and fresh flowers, on a small table in one corner of the room, small bowls of sliced cucumbers, fried rice and vegetables from the family's kitchen sat before the photo, where twice a day the family and visiting friends offer prayers for the young boy's soul. We will do this until we get his remains and bury him or cremate him, a nook sent the sumphone one of the brothers, said quietly. Mrs. Synthesumphone has had all the photographs in their home of her son removed, except the one that adorns a small shrine in the living room. After his brother's death and his own traumatic experiences Somsak is living very private life with his wife.
Conorak is buried at Holy Cross Cemetery and Mausoleum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His mother passed away in 2019 and rests at the same cemetery as her youngest son. Conorak died at the age of 14. If he were alive, he would be 47 today.